All right, welcome back. It's still morning line with Nancy, and it's time for our discussion segment. Professor Ken Ife, an economist, is joining us this morning to look at uh, the issues surrounding uh, what we say the, economy, the global economic outlook and its impact uh, on Nigeria and Africa generally. Professor Ken Ife, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for inviting me. Welcome, Prof. So it Thank is still you. in line to say um, Happy New Year. And, and you too. Exactly. <laughs> so now let's quickly start by, um, as we've seen, um, what they call um, New, Year, New, Year, New Year, New Year resolutions. One of it is Macquarie Research has tagged 2019 as the year of living dangerously. And IMF also stated that 2019 is a year of um, political uncertainty. Now, the question I'll be asking you first is, how would you see 2019 this year? It's going to be a very challenging year, not least because we are going to have an election. And you know the uncertainties around the election is more felt on the, on the capital market. Uh, and you see you know, uh, portfolio investments f flying out of the country. And then you find companies unwilling to roll, roll, roll their investments over. And, so, and then they start taking profits mm -hmm. away. So those things are inevitable. But it's just that in this particular moment, Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. is increasing rates, although, rates. although um, <coughs> the pres their president is on the case mm -hmm. um, and the jury is out on, on what next is they have to do. So the thing is that all of these have converged to create more uh, impact on, on, on investment flows. And many countries have tumbled. You know, you can see India, China, India, uh, Ghana, South Africa, they've devalued by as much as 5 to 15 percent. But Nigeria is holding up. Mm. And, and, and we thank God that we are still not doing wholesale devaluation mm. at this stage. Okay. But overall, there are good, reasonable growth forecasts. It's not going to be as bad as many people think. Mm. And, uh, and, and we, we have to, it has to prove good. When you say it's not going to be as bad as many people think, we've seen uh, international institutions, uh, Brentwood institutions coming out to say that in 2019 uh, there is a likelihood of, uh, you know, having what we had into 2007, that's probably having a recession. So when you say it's not as bad as we look, is it that, you know, how, how do we, you know, uh, try to explain these, what the institutions are coming up with? Well, they're, they're predicting recession. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Even America is not free from that prediction. Even as they are returning very high yeah, growth figures, it may be worse. Historic, I, they, they say it may be historic worse. growth figures, they still project that America will come into recession. But I don't think Nigeria will enter a recession in 2019. That I can tell you. Okay. Uh, because um, we're going to have a good report on growth uh, for the last quarter because we do cyclically. We do tend to have a positive, uh, much more positive at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, there's going to be tension and that's going to affect growth prospects into in the first quarter mm -hmm. and probably in the second quarter. And partly because budget will not going to come out before the second quarter, end of the second quarter. Mm -hmm. So there are things that are going to dampen growth prospects in the first and second quarter of this year. But in the third and fourth quarter, there will be a pickup. And I think we may end up averaging just over 2% mm -hmm. as they projected. World Bank project 2.2%. Our, our ERPG program and government projects 3%. 3 so we will find ourselves somewhere around, around that figure, 2.2, 2.5. So that's, that's where we're probably going to end up. Mm. Okay. It's st now, still looking at the global, um, the global um, landscape now. Now, let's talk about the trade wars that we've seen developing so far so much. We've seen, although the negotiations are supposed to, uh, they have started already, but mm. we've not seen the outcome of the negotiations. Br briefly tell us what the trade war and how it is in 2019. If there is no um, agreement between these two, the, the, between the two largest economies, other African um, countries will be, will be affected, right? And Nigeria is yeah, the trade war you're talking about is between America and China. China. Mm. And in fact, the mere fact that they have started talking has actually encouraged the price of crude to rise. Mm. Because people can now see the light in the end of the tunnel. But if it doesn't work out, and even as it is right now, it's affecting global economy. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And you could see the impact on the, the industries in China and also in America. You've seen the profit warnings of, of, uh, uh, of Apple and, and many others are, are, are coming through. The thing is, China is the biggest consumer of our oil. And if their economy, their industry is being affected, it's going to affect our oil, the demand for the oil. And so, you know, it's, uh, uh, um, India and, and all that. So are big, these are the big buyers of our products. So, in a way, it will affect our receivables. The fact that their economy is down, their industries are down, will affect our receivable from oil. But there may be a compensation from oil output figures, very encouraging figures. Mm -hmm. We've gone higher by 9%. 
which is now 2.09 uh, barrels, uh, million barrels per day. Mm. And also gas, gas has returned 3% growth. And I think I find the gas far more promising because if you look at, if you break down the 6.9 million, uh, billion barrels per uh, billion uh, scope, uh, that is a standard cubic feet. If you break it down, about 42% of it goes for export and about 16% goes for domestic consumption. Now, that 1.5 billion scoff that goes for domestic consumption, NMPs has actually projected it will go up to 5 billion scoff in 2020. Now, that is a big news because from their projection, the power delivery in the country generation can actually increase by 500%. So a lot of gas is going to be available, which means we are probably going to see a new industrialization base built on gas. So that is very, very encouraging for people to now feel that in 2020, going forward, we might have up to 500% increase in gas-based exactly. power generation. But the, but the thing is, we've seen so many projections, so many, so many projections coming out from the government. But are there infrastructures put in place that would also, when, when you project, because what people see now is they, they, they target anything, any projection coming from, from, from economic managers and also NMPC and, and, the, and the likes of them as lip service projections. Are there infrastructures that will support the projections? Well, I think, I, I think th we're not talking about projections as such because we're talking about the real good news because you have got an increase in the oil production. Exactly. And it wasn't wishful. It was actually as a result of the plan. You need to read the paper. You see what the NMPC has actually done in, in getting more, organizing more peace with the stakeholders, community stakeholders, investing, even the, the equity participation of government of in the oil companies mm -hmm. that are rejigging and rebalancing this. Even the... The, the restructuring that has taken place, that has freed $1.5 billion. So there are real things going on flowing from their ARPG plan. Yeah. But what we said, people don't even talk about the plan. You're going to base your discussions on the plan that you have on your hand so that yeah. you can see the achievement and the weaknesses and, the weaknesses. and then walk our way forward. So, yes, there's a, a bit of optimism in those focus, but they are real because you can see the tangible... If all the exports stopped and the gas were all available for power generation, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But the fact is that one of the big constraints to the power generation is that they're not having enough gas. Although, of course, the second one is that the distribution companies are not returning the money yeah. <laughs> for the gas that they were, for the power that they were. So the only 20% or 25% of what they, they actually sold is what they are paying back with. So that is a big, a big gap in there. Okay. Maybe that maybe that's where we, probably we, what he, what he was trying to also speak about, like you've mentioned, now, the aspect of generation and distribution is that do we have you know are we improving infrastructure probably in terms of power, our power infrastructure to enable us receive gas and also have the infrastructure for the distribution and generation. Can we say that there is an improvement in the power sector right that now? That is that isn't synergy. They haven't seen them synchronized because what happens is that. I remember one figure in August, uh, last, August 2006, when I looked at the figure, I could see where they generated 2.9 uh, uh, billion dollars. Yeah. No, 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 I'm talking okay. about the power generation, the power that was generated and handed over by NBET to the oh, distribution so companies. Okay. The distribution companies were only able to pay 24% of that money. Mm. Now, the fact is this, how do you expect power generation companies to use 24% of the receivable, and they use that to defray the cost of gas coming to them, defray the loan, the repayment of loans that they have borrowed, mm. pay salaries, maintain infrastructure. It's not possible. So you're going to see tension there. So you can't keep taking gas from somebody who has invested mm. and who already has a market outside where he's selling and exporting this gas and making decent money. Mm. And you can see that from the tax returns from, from these people. So it, it, it's, it's a big challenge. And then on the other hand, you find the distribution companies, many of them reluctant to implement metering, mm. which means that people, which will make them more efficient because you will give power because you know if you don't give it, mm. then you don't get the money. So that, that was a big gap. And of course, part of the whole analysis was that the end bet should have taken loan from uh, World Bank, which they actually did, to ensure that you guarantee at least 80% 80%. of payment to generator, to, to power generation companies, mm. so that they can keep them afloat. And when they do their business plan or revise their business plan, they work on receiving 80% and then at least, so in the, in the short term. But all of that are falling apart. Mm -mm. 
we've, we have seen, that, okay, still staying on this issue now, we've seen that the brand futures are trading at $62.21 per barrel, which is good news. Now, the um, benchmark for the 2019 budget is placed at $60. Um, is it to who yet, or should we, do we still need to go back to revise the 2019 budget? No, I don't think we should. First of all, as at the time the fiscal strategy paper and the medium term expenditure framework that paper were at the budget. Mm -hmm. Usually yes. they start doing, they do that around the end of June. June. Mm -hmm. yeah. But somewhere, exactly. I don't know what's going on with it because I haven't seen that it's been approved. But, but, but that's when that conceptualization took place. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a considerable headroom between the 60 that they went for and the going price. I think it was around 70 something. Now, the thing is that that is a moving target. Crude price is a moving target. We can't do anything until they, actually, they, they use their figures based on what they saw when they were doing up their PIM. Mm. But then, the assembly still needs to work on the budget. And you know that they will, they will alter the budget, you know, without a doubt, because they argue that it is within their purview. So they will out of, so by the time they look at this budget, which may be around May, May something, they will alter the figures. And the price is a moving target. You don't even know what the price may It might come down to $40, uh, dollars. $40. it might go higher to $70, but it's a moving target. But, but if it goes down, is it, is it not, uh, it, it, will, it will affect the budget if it, if it no, doesn't go down? It's always been, even throughout last year, it always affects budget. But I think one thing you need to bear in mind in all your price this 2019 is that there are hostages to fortune mm. in, this, in this year. One is that the shale oil price, the shale oil production tends to go down when the price of crude comes down mm. because of financing issues. And they have very high costs. They, you know, they, they have a very high, the highest cost is on shale production. So they were going down when the price was low. Now the price is climbing up, they start coming back. Secondly, Qatar has left the OPEC. They left at 600,000 barrels a day. And because they fell out with Saudi Arabia, they already have a plan to do 6 million barrels per day by 2022. So as they have crashed out, using an excuse that it is about concentration on their gas, which is not true, um, they're going to they, they're play foul. And they're going to start producing more crude. And, they, and that's going to affect the, the market, the, the, you know, the supply situation. Now, looking at the uh, our forecast of the report by the World Bank, we see that um, it's, it's for 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 Nigeria and probably you want to say Angola, the issue of oil is is what may likely you know have impact, especially on our growth. Angola is you know forecast to grow at two point nine percent, and that's looking at the fact that they have new oil fields that uh, they will be exploring. And for Nigeria, we already know that the issue of uh, oil definitely that's one of the that's major. Uh, you know, revenue and as even though we know what the structure we say we're diversified and all of those. Now, the sub, uh, sub, uh, sub Saharan Africa projected to go at 3.4%. If we have issues with oil, do we still see that projection by the World Bank still being realizable? Well, you know, the, the growth, in terms of growth, our non oil revenues are beginning to play a much more significant part mm. on the growth, on the growth projections and, and realizations. If you look at some of the last quarters, the quarters last year, there were occasions where the, the, the beginning of the year, oil was important. But later, the, the non-oil revenue were, were far more important in boosting the, in the, the GDP figures. And I like to see that that is going to continue. Because in the end of the day, after all, oil accounts for only 10% of our GDP or thereabouts. And then the rest of them, the more energy, and resources and incentives we put to, to export and, and, and production on the other sides of the economy, the more we we'll get a growth, a better growth uh, picture mm -hmm. in the 2019. Okay, now now let's look at our, um, one of the projections and one of the predictions. It's not today that we start, they we have been warning us about our the need to diversify our revenue um, allocation base. But now on one hand, IMF is warning us about our debt revenue and also dependence on oil. By our, but our economic managers are telling us there is no cause for alarm. Is there any cause for alarm about uh, the fact that our debt is increasing? Currently, it's pegged at um, 22 point, 22 22.43 trillion naira. Is there any okay. cause for alarm? Okay, let me deal with the issue of debt. And uh, you need to give me a bit more time because I need to unpack this. And uh, there's unpack so much it. confusion. There's so much negative, co so much confusion in the country on, on, on the debt situation. We do not have, my opening statement on that, we do not have a debt crisis. What we have is a revenue crisis. And let me give you the figures. Um, two authorities. One is the uh, CIA that looked at debt to ratio, debt to GDP, GDP ratio, ratio, from 2004 
till today. And what we came out to for Nigeria is that apart from 2005, when we prepaid our loan, we had the lowest debt to GDP ratio of 11%. After that, it jumped to broadly the same level. The highest was in 2013, when we had 19.3% debt to GDP. In 2017, it actually came down to 15.3% debt to GDP, and that was $70 billion. Today, it's gone up again uh, to 20% exactly. at 73%. The reason why it's fluctuating is because the GDP itself is also a moving target. It's going up and down. So you keep on measuring. But broadly, that, that percentage has remained broadly the same. So it ha it ha there's no cause for alarm. But let me tell you where that positions Nigeria. As of that 2017 analysis, Nigeria was 189 in the list of all countries in the world their debt to GDP. People like Japan is 223%, Greece 180 uh, UK 25th, 90%, and African countries, some of them, Gambia 116%. So Nigeria did well, being 189. So we're so, so at the bottom. But let's look at more interesting one that was done by Forbes. Forbes looked at three parameters. It looked at the national debt, it looked at GDP, and they looked at debt to GDP for all countries. Mm. And they naturally came out and voted Nigeria as number one in Africa in debt management. Why? Why did, why did they come to that figure? I'll only give you three, three countries. Mm. U.S. has 21 trillion uh, national debt, and their foreign reserves is 125 billion. And their percentage of GDP to uh, debt to GDP was 76%. UK are owing 2.3 trillion, they are, they are, their foreign reserve 164 billion, and is 89 percent their GDP, their debt to GDP. Mm. China, surprisingly, is owing 4.3 trillion, mm. and they have 3.1 trillion reserves, huge, but they also have 41 percent debt to GDP. Mm. Now put Nigeria next, which is what they did. Mm. Nigeria has 73 billion dollar debt, the five lowest and has 47 billion res uh, reserves. Look at it, America is only three, three times, less than three times more reserves. But look at the debt, 21 trillion. And our debt to GDP is 21%. So Forbes didn't want to say Nigeria was the best in the world, it just said Nigeria was the best in Africa, in mm. terms of debt money. But from right. you are so the best in what, the world. No, 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 no um, we are somewhere there. We are, <laughs> we are there in that first 10. But the thing is, we are not on debt crisis. Because if you look at the international benchmark, it's 40% debt to GDP. Mm. Look at all the others are well two, three times. Japan, mm -hmm. as I said, is 223%. So that is not it. We have considerable headroom. But the issue is this. What are you spending that money on? Prof, let's hold.